In a world full of distractions, there is one big question on every dog owner's lips. How do I become more than just the person holding the other end of the leash? We all get dogs with a dream in mind, a vision of the future. And if right now your everyday reality isn't quite that picture you had in mind, you are in the right place. It really doesn't have to be this way. You absolutely can and will be more to your dog than just the person who gets in between them and the world. The key is you need to be more sexy. More sexy than the neighbourhood cats. More sexy than the jogger in the park. More sexy than that half-eaten hamburger they just found on the floor. And yes, even more sexy than the dog across the road. I'm Tom. And I'm Lauren. Together Together we're we're Absolute Absolute Dogs. Dogs. And you're listening to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. And welcome to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast, the podcast that gives you real life dog training results and life results. So today I am joined by the wonderful Rachel. Rachel has uh, been one of my vet team over the last year and is someone I'd really, really like everyone that's listening to be able to uh, meet and find out a little bit about you really, Rachel. So welcome, Rachel. I really wanted everyone to hear a little bit about what you do because I think it's pretty special. Now you are a vet, so I'm going to introduce you as a vet, but I think you have some different interests. So I don't know if we want to introduce yourself. I love that you're here with your two dogs. And I know you think you've got three dogs, but one's maybe in a different spot. Um, But um, tell us about what you do, Rachel, and um, yeah, how long you've done it. Tell tell us a little bit about you and, and, and your life. Okay, so I qualified as a vet in the year 2000, and I'm terrible at remembering dates, but I can remember that one because it's pretty, pretty special. So <laughs> I, was a, I was a new millennium vet. Um, just very briefly, I was going to be a horse vet, uh, you know, love horses. Uh, but just after I qualified, I got a little border terrier, my first border terrier. I wanted a little dog that would run with a horse, would come out on the, in the car with me, you know, when I was on call and so on. And just for fun, I started doing a bit of agility and then Uh-oh. the trainer said to me oh I think she could be quite good so I popped along to a show and it turned out she was brilliant and um, I was pretty rubbish as you know we all are when we start with our dogs but she was amazing just one of those real dogs who could just do it all um, and then I did agility for a couple of years and then 2004 I thought oh I will go along to a team GB qualifying day I didn't know anything about it but it was free uh, to enter and I thought I'll go along get some experience Bargain. Oh, my, little lady, my little nutmeg she won the qualifier one small qualifier and I said brilliant you're going to the world championships and I said ah right where, where are we going and we were actually going to Monte Chiari in Italy and it was an amazing experience and I think from there you know completely hooked uh, then I found people started to perhaps bring their dogs to me if they were having a bit of a problem because they knew I understood agility so they would perhaps go to their vet who'd say oh it's fine just don't do agility with them or you know just give them painkillers and they didn't really understand, you know, the dogs just, they love to do it, they want to do it, and it's much, sort of, it's better for them mentally, mentally and physically if they can do what they love doing. So people sort of started coming, and then, I think we probably met 2006, Lauren, I'm going to say, Basel, wasn't Crazy. it? Crazy. Yeah, Crazy. first time was a long time ago. And we were very, very, very young men, of course. Very, very young, like, very, very young. like Sorry. literally Sorry. not even Sorry. not even old enough to drive, I mean. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, and so we jogged along there and then in 2009 the vet on the team uh retired so I I was then for a while vet and and uh competitor so Maggie finally retired at the age of 11 <laughs> bless her from team GB and I carried on as team GB vet until um just before Covid actually when I stepped down to hopefully perhaps get on the team with this super puppy and um, because my son also is, is stolen the other dog who's not here to run on young kennel club so But in the meantime, I've trained in acupuncture and hydrotherapy and then um, did the canine rehabilitation certificate with the University of Tennessee, which sounds amazing, but most of it was online. I didn't get to go to Tennessee at all. Did all the lectures online, but then I did have a 10 day trip to Mallorca right by the beach to do all the practical stuff. And then I had to go back a year later to do the exam. So it was tough. It was very tough, but someone had to do it. (laughs) <laughs> so that's yeah that's me so my work mainly now is working with sports dogs or injured dogs or lame dogs arthritic dogs dogs that are in pain or struggling and getting them well which is amazing fantastic and I get to meet lovely people and and lovely dogs all day what a great job 
you and you really do um a, a very great job i know that obviously i've like like you said we've known each other since we were seven and um and very young <laughs> and uh uh, for me, uh, being able to work with a vet who has sports expertise is really, really refreshing. And also someone who understands the sport really from a competitor's perspective. So Rachel, obviously we were Team Great Britain. Um, you were my vet when um, we were Team Great Britain. Uh, but equally, actually, um, yeah, we, you've recently been my vet in, in, a, in a different capacity. And we'll go on to talk about that in a minute. So tell me a little bit about, did you always want to be a vet? Like, was this always something you wanted to do? And did you always dream of doing this? Like working with dogs. We talk to a lot of people who want to work with dogs. We have our pro dog trainer course, talking mm -hmm. to people who want to understand more about dogs and dog training. But some of them didn't ever get to do this when they were younger or some of them did dream of doing it but never followed their passion like how did it come about for you being a vet well very boringly i i never wanted to do anything else uh, so that made life quite easy as a child uh, my mum says i think from about the age of four i was going to be a vet i had lots of animals yeah i just was totally tunnel visioned i wanted i wanted nothing else <laughs> at no. all and i'm there's no vets in the family uh, they're all builders and architects and <laughs> but yeah but no I I never wanted to do anything else, and your so. partner is your partner a vet my partner is a musician he's a he pianist and a singer so but he did do a bit of agility I didn't meet him for agility funnily <laughs> enough but uh he he had the spaniel that he sadly lost last year he had smudgy spaniel and he did a bit of agility so uh, and I'm a very terrible uh, but keen amateur pianist and singer so it sort of it sort of works <laughs> quite well and tell us um, a little bit about your dogs and the dogs that you have and the dogs that you work. So the lovely dogs I have, I'm still addicted to border terriers after this little one. This was my first one, little nutmeg, my champion, agility champion. Um, and the old boy here, I'm afraid he's starting to snore. He isn't actually old, he's only <laughs> nine and a half. This is Teasel Weasel. And he came along when I still have Meg and I selected him specially for speed. Uh, looking at his shoulder angles and based on some research we did years ago actually on the team GB squad looking at shoulder angles leg length and so on and uh, <clears throat> he is incredibly fast unfortunately he's not really happy in a show situation so he's never progressed brilliantly in agility he loves training he loves going on training days training at home he loves working with me but he's he's a bit worried in the ring so he I yeah I changed him we do canicross, cross which was a big thing for me because I I love running an agility ring, but no further. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, jogging. I agree. So we've taken up running, got running harness with him, and he's done. He's done a couple of triathlons as well, where I swum with him, biked with him, and ran with him. And he loves that. He's strapped to his mother. He's a mother's boy. So there's him, very fast, but in agility terms, useless. Bless him. Oh. Uh, and somewhere there's a little fluffy, fluffy border terrier, Nelly, who I just rescued. I've lost Meg three weeks before we weren't meant to be getting another one we were meant to be going back to two dogs and this little border terrier needed a home she was five months old I fostered her you know I said I'll have her for a bit I can't have her for very long <laughs> so she's that was six years ago and she's very sweet little dog um very willful actually and stubborn sometimes and she used to she she sort of took to the agility but she did visit the judges a lot and people at the ring eating sandwiches and the burger van and the treat stand so for the first couple of years it was quite frustrating and then it all clicked and she's she's come on now uh, up to grade five but she's not the fastest dog in the world she's like a little a little clockwork toy running around so <laughs> she is now running with my son who is seven they are starting their ykc career and she'll be brilliant for that you know she's really reliable now really good girl so what i thought i'd do because you know i've got a bit of time on my hands you know i decided to breed from the two of them they're completely unrelated I did all their health testing and so on and tried to breed a super puppy which I hope I've done this, and this one this is Stardust who is oh. 16 months old in training she's very fast um we'll see so we'll see what happens exciting exciting yeah, it exciting. is exciting brilliant fun brilliant fun so Tell everyone a little bit about the type of vet you are and what you do on a day to day basis, because as much as I know you do some general sort of vet work, you also have some areas you're particularly interested in. And I know that's the reason our paths have crossed more recently. Tell us on a day to day basis what type of vet you are, Rachel. So mostly I would say I'm a yeah, I don't, how, how would I describe myself? I suppose, yeah, nearly 100 percent of my time 
in normal working hours is, is canine rehabilitation, I suppose we could call it, or sports sports medicine. But it, it isn't just sports dogs. And actually, it's not just dogs because I'll do cats or guinea pigs or anything. Anything that's lame or sore that needs help. Sports guinea pigs. <laughs> guinea pigs. I've done, yeah, I've done orthopedic surgery on guinea pigs. Oh, physio. Wow. Guinea pigs. We've done uh, skunks, all sorts of things. Anything. And it, literally any animal. Because my other, my other slight sort of veterinary interest is exotic animals as well. Because I keep snakes and skunks and spiders. And so I've treated stick insects and crocodiles and monkeys and all sorts. But the vast um, bulk of my work would be, would be dogs. And um, so... I think yes. If I'm if I'm a specialist in, in anything, it's really sort of diagnosing difficult problems or soft tissue injuries, uh, or yeah, the dogs that are just lame or not right that people can't get to the bottom of. And I came at it both, I guess, from the agility world, but also I used to do a lot um, more sort of orthopedic surgery. I don't do so much sort of cutting bones and things now, anywhere near as much, just because of time pressure. But I started from from that sort of angle and then doing all the, the I was interested in the post-op rehab and how to get them you know really fit and strong again afterwards so now what I tend to do is a lot of watching dogs and putting my hands on them feeling just finding muscles that are sore or tendons that are sore and then I think that's the key to it really is is knowing what everything should feel like and then when there's a problem knowing what tests you want to to do because we're, we're so lucky now we have MRI scanners and CT scanners and amazing ultrasound scanners but you need to know you need to correlate it to which bits actually saw, and then if you find something in that area, you say yes, that is that is significant, and then going on to treat that as well. And that's not just me; we work very much as part of a, a, a team. So we have a chiropractor and a physio, and great nurses and that. And so we all sort of put our heads together to get to the root of the problem. And often there's more than one problem, or there's one problem that's then caused a lot of other problems. So it's trying to work out what's what's the primary problem, what's the secondary problem, and and fixing it hopefully. It becomes a bit of a workup, doesn't it? And I think that's mm-hmm. something that I want our listeners to understand that when you go to whether that's your vet or your physio or anybody else, I think it does take a team sometimes to get to the bottom of something, but also to be able to recover it. So, mm. um, and, and I will go into a couple of my dogs in a minute, but but I definitely know that it takes a team. Um, and I see you as part of um, my team. Mm. And I see that the importance of having uh, different sort of team players really on, on that team and people that can work together because mm. you do need to work with your Cairo and your physio and you do need to sometimes have a reality check as to where we are. Um, mm. And I think those things are, are really um, important. So um, in terms of your, um, like you work with the um, injury diagnostics, I suppose, and rehab, what sort of um, things, so I'm, I'm going to ask you, I think we'll do, let's let's talk about Tokyo. So Tokyo, mm-hmm. um, my young uh, two-year-old border collie, fantastic athlete, just like you said, um, with Stardust, you've got really high hopes and you're really excited about like what's coming. And then all of a sudden I'm watching and I'm like, there's a skip there. And the more I watch, the more I find it because you look for something and it's there. So I come to you and um, you diagnose an iliopsoas strain. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that we won't go into crazy detail on, but it's something that is quite common, right? Like it's something you see. Yes, yes, it's really common. I think it's a really common thing that would come to me. And I think that is because it can be quite difficult to diagnose. So I see, you know, two or three a day. But that's because they're, they're specifically, I suppose, finding me because they're, yeah. they're having problems. Uh, and I think uh, iliopsoas, we don't want to go into loads of anatomical detail, but it's it's a muscle that helps um, stabilise sort of hip and the, and the back. So it can be injured as a primary injury, uh, but it can also be a secondary problem. So particularly in an older dog, you might be thinking, well, OK, we've got a problem in this iliopsoas muscle, but actually it's because there's a problem in the spine and so on. So it's very much part of the workup is ruling out all of those things and then trying to diagnose the iliopsoas injury which can be tricky um to 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 find and with tokyo's we found on ultrasound didn't we but it was a very tiny amount of damage but causing a lot of problems because it tends to make them adjust the stride and and you get this skipping stride and then that causes Mm -hmm. problems and I think that was probably the most frustrating thing for me because I'd gone to MRI. I mm-hmm. so I'd MRI'd him. I had um, CT'd him. I'd had various sort of professionals work him up and say, "Nope, he's all good, Lauren." And I'm like, "I know you're saying this, but he's not what I'm looking." And mm-hmm. I mean, he's physically gifted. Like he's a really physically talented. He's immensely. Ta- he's a lovely dog, to be honest. He's just a lovely dog. And so 
for me, you can become very frustrated as a dog owner because you're asking all of the right questions and you're possibly doing all of the right, um, like using all the right tools, but actually missing the point somehow. Um, mm. And so you had a look at him. We looked at him under ultrasound. I came to you because someone else had said, look, go to Rachel. So us is, is Rachel. So go and see her. Um, you, you found that. And for me, the regenerative options that you offered me, as much as some of them, I think probably for me are a bit scary, you had lots to offer me. So let's just talk a little bit of regenerative therapies in dogs, some of the things that you might be able to use, because these for me, as much as I'd heard um, people talk about them, I'd heard them talking about them in older dogs. So mm-hmm. I'd not really heard, I'd heard of them talked about in arthritic dogs or dogs who were um, a little bit um, sore because of, yeah, really age. Actually for Tokyo, we were using them in a very different way. And, and as a two-year-old dog, there's a different um, need really. Like I really needed to use things, but at the same time for a different reason than a 14-year-old. So what options do you have, Rachel, with, we're not saying psoas here, I'm just saying regenerative medicine, because that's what a lot of time you're doing. Yes, yes. So look, the, the main things I'd be doing would be the, the stem cell, of stem cell transplants and the platelet-rich plasma and there's a whole there's lots of other things that we can inject as, as, as well you know but I think probably we'd be here literally all night I could talk all night so I won't <laughs> but I think that there's two main features of these the really nice features of these types of therapies that they were called biological therapies so we're basically trying to get the body to heal itself but we also want it to heal completely want to get primary healing of tissue so the tissue being replaced with the same sort of tissue and and that that's what's so exciting I think about these regenerative things because in the past with healing we were relying on scar tissue forming and then the physio and so on which was an important part and still is very important part of everything to to get you know that scar tissue as, as mobile as possible but if you've got scar tissue and that could be in any sort of soft tissue so a muscle or a tendon or a ligament that's healed if it heals with scar tissue it is inherently weaker uh, there's inherently an area there that if they tweak it, it or it's not as elastic for a start so if they overstretch it it, it could be sore so injuries that heal with scar tissue they can go back to work but you find that oh you know they've just tweaked it a little bit and so on the exciting thing about the stem cells is they can regenerate so they can turn into other tissue types so if you've got a tendon with a hole in um, then what they'll do they'll you put the stem cells in and they will go and battle the inflammation first but then they will sit in and become tendons or muscles and it's healed so and the nice thing with the ultrasound as well you can follow that up so you can actually watch and say right it's healed you know and we know we're ready to move on to the next sort of stage of the rehab and so on and it's that's still a really important part of it so i think stem cells on their own they can be really magical but you'll only get half the effects if you don't do all the work. And you're amazing at that, Lauren, at doing all the homework and, and you know, every exercise we set you religiously, which is, which is great. And it gives, you know, makes a real, real difference as well. It's, um, I, I'm a regular pest with questions. I know I'm like, how about this, Rachel? What about that? But <laughs> I think, um, I think that having the right input and team like you Mm. said you can do so much with the regenerative work and then you also need to follow it up with actually looking after the care of the dog at the same time. Yeah, and getting them moving again because often a dog's pattern, their movement patterns very quickly. So a lot, I know we've chatted about this before, a lot of dogs' movement isn't processed in the brain. So, which is why people say, well, I don't know, they still will run off down the field. If a deer runs down, even if they've got a broken leg, they're going to run. And part of that is reflexive movement. So that's information goes from the feet and the, the lower limb joints and so on as to where the leg is. It goes up to the spine and back down again. It doesn't go up to the brain. So there isn't that bit where we would set off running and go, oh, blimey, this is, this is going to hurt. You know, I better stop. And dogs don't have that when the adrenaline's up. And it also means that when they get into a way of moving that's different, so with a bit of a skip or a bit of an adjustment stride, it can be quite hard then because that can become almost wired in, like hard wired in, and that's the way they move. So you can take all the pain away, but they still move in that way. And that's the that's the rehab challenge, really. Of and getting that, that for me, oh, it's like a, I'm, I'm almost scared to try because I'm like, oh, what if he does that? Like, I don't want to even see yeah. it. Like, you don't want to see it. And yet, I'll be honest, Tokyo was never, ever lame, really. He was just mm. just this weird intermittent skip when he was going around a wing in, in agility that mm. I could see. Um, so it wasn't ever he got up sore or he got up stiff or he got up lame. And yet, these are things that often pet owners might miss mm. or um, commonly could be missed until they're more of a problem. So they, they could get to a more problematic stage, I imagine, Rachel, right? 
absolutely yeah absolutely and I suppose what was nice about Tokyo is I did see him very early and that's starting to happen I think more with people there is more awareness out there and people come in at an earlier stage but quite often yeah there's a whole succession of, of, of problems you know and it's much much harder and the longer they've been doing the sort of the way of moving the harder it is to unravel it and unpick it and particularly with all these lovely regenerative medicine options you know that the earlier you treat them the better really and that's been a change I've been doing for a good number of years now and when we first started because it was quite new therapy you know we, we didn't have a lot of scientific data we were always fairly happy that it, it's a pretty safe procedure and no, no procedure is 100% without risk or complication but these are pretty low we're using you know the, the animal's own sort of cells if you like to heal itself but initially we started with the very severe ones so we tried everything you know very arthritic dogs have very severe soft tissue injuries and we we've been through all the other options we had we're like well we'll try this and then because of the very encouraging results we we were getting you then start using it earlier and earlier and the earlier you use it the better i mean even with arthritis really if you've got holes in the cartilage and you put stem cells in that it's realistic to think they'll sort of fill those in if you like and become yeah. part of it if you've got no cartilage left there's not it's not going to regrow a whole you know a whole joint for you they'll still do lots they're still very good at taking away pain but it, it's going to be limited you're going to have to repeat a lot more so definitely the earlier the better but I think it is it is difficult you know it because some of these things are quite hard to pin down what the problem is so and I think as you always say it is sensible to keep asking the questions and finding the people who can who can help it's, really you just got to keep really curious haven't you like you're always I'm, I'm, and the hard thing with questions is you ask some people questions and I think they feel very challenged by your question hmm. or they feel that you're questioning their authority or their knowledge whereas hmm. actually some of us ask questions in an inquiring way I mean for those people that don't know that are listening my background I had a law I have a law degree so hmm. my law degree you naturally have a very inquiring mind when you have that sort of history your, your mind is inquiring and your mind is asking questions and so my questions would always be to ascertain information, mm. not challenge, and to try and make a plan. So I'm always trying to make a plan. I'm like, what's the plan? I don't know the plan. The plan. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the hardest things is um, I'm fine with them. Or oh, someone has a squeaky. That's always fun. And um, I'm fine with um, having giving dogs rest or giving dogs um, treatment plans or any of those things. But I do want to know the plan. And I think that's quite hard sometimes, isn't it? Because we're working with dogs. That actually, we don't always know what direction it's going to go in. We know where yeah. we think it's going to go. but And that's the commonest thing I get asked by, even by other vets, actually, in the rehab world. They say, well, what's the what's the hydrotherapy plan for a dog post cruciate? And I say, well, there, there isn't one for any dog post cruciate because they are all different. And mm -hmm. yes, you know, a, a ruptured cruciate ligament is quite a common injury. It's, yeah fixed surgically so they're a lot more consistent than some of the soft tissue injuries and we have a rough idea that at four weeks they'll be doing this and eight weeks they'll be doing that but they're very different and what they what they do in the treadmill some might have water on the floor and some might have it up around the hips it, it, it's very individual so that's that's hard people want you to say oh this is the these are the numbers you're not like that really but i you know i personally I love the questions like working with you because I think the questions are great and also, also sometimes it challenges us to think about things or think about new things or sometimes people have read something I did have a lady who'd read about a, a she found a scientific paper on a supplement that can help the stem cells do more and I hadn't I hadn't heard of that and that was really interesting to me and I said oh you know do send me the link and I'm, I'm going to have a look at it and that sort of thing so I love that but I think you're right some people do feel it as a challenge as, as challenging whereas I, I like to always be learning more yeah, no, I think you're very, um, you're very, very welcoming of of questions, Rachel, and I, I appreciate that. I know that again, another supplement um, I use and have played around with is just muscle building supplements after um, injuries and things like that. And whether they're right or whether they're wrong, I think it's looking into what can we do better and is there anything we can do better. And some things I think it doesn't hurt to try. Other things I think you have to be a little bit more careful. Like I wouldn't just play it, play it some things now. One of the things that you did with Tokyo um, and we talked about since really it was shockwave. So shockwave mm. being another therapy um, that we've uh, had a look at, obviously acupuncture, laser. We've talked on lots of these. Uh, just tell us a little bit about shockwave as well, because um, that's another one that for me, it feels a little bit more new to me. 
Mm. I mean, it's very new. It's, it's very. It's not. It's not new in the human world, and it's much more commonly used in the horse world, actually. So more horse vets or physios perhaps would have it, but there's not many places at the moment offering it for dogs. Uh, I think it's a bit of an off-putting ther- uh, name, actually, because people shockwave sounds a bit like electricity or shocks, and it isn't that at all. It's sound waves. So it's yeah. it's basically the shock is a, is a sound shock. So it's like a little sonic boom. Yeah, uh, the night shockwave it falls in the category of electrotherapy, so people may have heard of laser or ultrasound. So it falls in that category. But the the different thing with shockwave is it a couple of things really. It will actually have the ability to break down mineralization. So if you've got a mineralized tendon in particular, then the shockwave is really helpful. I have to well, excuse you very quickly. Tokyo is playing downstairs and that is <laughs> what is going on. It sounds like some sort of like baby dinosaur having somebody oh. playing with grave, I think. Um, I so carry on. Yours, yours has been perfect. Yours has been perfect. Carry on. <laughs> um, yeah, so it has this property of breaking down mineralization, which is sort of a, a unique property of, of that type of therapy. But also it's a bit of a, I always think it's a bit of an agitator. So always we're trying to get the body to heal itself, always. Um, and shockwave, can sort of restart an inflammatory response that, that will then progress to healing. So it very, very broadly speaking, if you, you know, if you twist your ankle and you've got a lot of inflammation, it's really swollen and puffy, then that's excessive inflammation. And we're trying to reduce inflammation in that stage. So we always, you know, we talk about anti-inflammatory medications and icing to reduce inflammation. And yes, in that very acute stage, we want to limit, we want to limit it because too much is not helpful. But yeah. actually inflammation itself is not necessarily a bad thing. So healing, it, there is an inflammatory phase to healing, um, yeah. but it's not excessive, if that makes sense. And no, I, a lot of uh, tendon injuries, in particular, or ligament injuries, because they're slow to heal, they often just get stuck. So they go along a little bit and they just get stuck at a certain level. And yeah. our aim of therapy really is to try and get them going again. And Shockwave is really good at doing that. So it, it sort of reignites that healing process. And then again, and I, your other therapies with physio and so on are then needed at that point as well. And I know it's quite a noisy therapy, uh, yes. particularly. Um, we're about to try it on <laughs> one of ours with um, yeah. without any sedation, because I think the ideal is you don't sedate them, ideally, yeah. right? Ideally, ideally, yeah. Um, we're we're going to try. How, how do you find dogs find it um, being a bit of a noisy therapy when they're not sedated? Well, this was a surprising thing, really, I think, to me, because we used to sedate them all, uh, and we, that's how I was taught to, to do it, and we just thought, that's really noisy, there's no way they'll tolerate that. And then we tried with one or two, and probably uh, probably my own dogs, that's usually, <laughs> usually the guinea pigs, uh, and we realised that actually the vast majority of dogs are fine with it. it. It's incredible, really. Even dogs that can be quite noise-sensitive don't react to it. Um, I have one or two where we have wrapped their heads in a towel, where we try to be a muff but we found just wrapping a tower on the head was better funny yeah. enough they were dogs that did seem to be a bit sensitive to noise but they were not noise sensitive dogs at home so the noise is obviously just a, a particular frequency of it for some reason upset them but yeah the vast majority are great it, it's amazing um and in terms of if you're using something like that what about the frequency um of how how you use it how often would you use something like that of treatment i, I guess ideally we would do it weekly um or fortnight so weekly to fortnightly and I guess the problem because there's not many machines around sometimes it's just a thing of people can't we, we can't come every week because they're like you hours hours away yeah, yeah. Um, so and it doesn't matter you wouldn't do it probably more often than weekly because in a yeah. way you're sort of poking the body a little bit and then you need it to respond so doing it yeah. daily doesn't make any logical sense because you're not giving the body time to respond so weekly would be um, the minimum frequency and in some cases, we might want to leave longer anyway. So it just depends on the on the condition, really. But yeah, so somewhere between weekly to two weekly um, would be ideal. And typically, we do four. Most things we'd maybe do four treatments, and then some will go on. It's quite a nice therapy for us. It's quite good for arthritic pain, actually. And in that case, they might have a sort of a, a course initially, and then they might have one every couple of months or every six weeks yeah. or something. Um, yeah, it, it's quite it's quite bearable. And so I suppose we're talking here about um, what to do with an injured dog. How about the types of fitness and conditioning or things that you can do preventatively? Where do we sit on preventative? Like what can you do with dogs? I think there's a lot you can do preventatively. And I mean, very 
sort of very simple things I, at home. I think one of the most important things is just to make sure the dogs are really aware of where their bodies are and doing some bits of sort of more conscious movement. We talked about how dogs are quite reflexive and they just charge around all over the place. And as a general rule, dogs, a bit like us, really, they, they build sort of power and speed muscles quite easily because they love running around but yeah. they don't necessarily build with stabilizing muscles so yeah. doing lots of body awareness work lots of just sort of uh, different types of touch even just around the back feet or lots of nice clicker work with target touches with fore and hind feet is uh, that's appropriate for any any dog and so uh, yes yeah, sensory work just encouraging dogs to be able to stand square that's really important it's not very fun <laughs> It's not very exciting. Oh, come on, Rachel, let's make uh, it fun. We've got to make it fun. Not fun. Uh, but, you know, and actually just doing lots of walking on different types of terrain, lots of different surfaces, and that could be out and about, or it could be things you put down at home, just really increasing their awareness and sensory input. I think that's really powerful, uh, of walking over poles, things like that. Beyond that, I think it does get difficult because what you need to achieve with dogs or what you're which bits you're trying to strengthen is really quite different with different dogs so if you are do have a dog that you're heading for some sort of sports career even if it's only in fun you know it I think it really pays to get them assessed quite early on and get get a specific program because generally dogs I mean they're, they're hugely different aren't they dogs you know in their um, body shape and characteristics and so on so they fall from you've got things like your bulldogs and your staffies that are incredibly strong very very strong but not very bendy up to your sort of border collies which are inc incredibly bendy and a lot of them are quite so, almost hypermobile like or jointed people so with um, this thing that i've read you know she's she's very very fast she's she's very um, for border so very long in the back and she is very bendy and you know very, very flexible so with her i'm definitely working on stability exercises yeah. building up her postural muscles so she's got the strength to support that uh, as she yeah. leaps around like a loony so that's important for her teaser when he was young and this may be something to do with how he was in the womb perhaps his birth i don't know but he never used to use his left leg as strongly as the right so he wasn't lame or anything but there was an imbalance there wow. so that obviously concerned me greatly and he actually was weaker down the inside of his leg so we need to strengthen those muscles. So when he was young, he spent a lot of time walking around with a poo bag on his foot that made him pick his foot up, the one foot up, and get stronger. And actually, we've never had any problems with it at, at all. So it did work. A friend of mine um, said, she always says that you have to be really creative when you yeah. work in rehab. And obviously, exactly. we've had yeah. um, a spinal case. We've had a dog with an ANMPE, um, which is obviously... Um, fairly difficult to manage I found at, at first and so yeah absolutely um you you become creative a poo bag on their foot yes a poo bag and it could be quite a simple quite a simple things yeah so I think there's a lot of sort of kits out there for fitness and conditioning for dogs which I mean it's great it's great that people are aware of it and people want to do yeah. it but I think it can be a little bit dangerous to just sort of follow a, a program because they are they are different and what you might need to achieve yeah. might be different as well so uh, generally we're trying to achieve balance we're trying to achieve a dog that can hold a nice square stand yeah. that moves nicely but as I say it might be different things that we need to do but as a general doing any sort of sensory work or just walking on different surfaces just walking at different speeds as well so if you are lead walking it's easy yeah. to get into a rhythm which is probably comfortable to your walking speed yeah. but actually consciously walking slower and actually making the dogs walk so if you've got a sort of medium size and upward dogs uh, they're going to be probably trotting most of the time and actually slowing down so that they walk yeah. is really beneficial because in walk each leg moves independently so it's yeah. quite a different way of walking to trotting and it does work the body much harder uh, you yeah. know, little dogs can often be sort of almost cantering along all the time. So you have to walk very slowly. With them. Uh, Blink, Blink, you had to really teach her walk. She had to wear a head collar and a lead because mm. you just couldn't stop her like cantering everywhere. On a harness, she was cantering. She was just cantering. I was just like, mm. I needed to slow her down. Like she just, mm. she wanted to elevate everywhere. Mm. And then we have the whole debate about dogs, pay, you know, dogs that pace. So they move both legs, front and back leg yeah. on the same side instead of trotting. Yeah. And it's some people think it's always abnormal some people think it's normal for some breeze but it, it's i think it it's something almost certainly to do with the speed of the person who's walking with them as well it, you know sometimes just it's between yeah. the trot and the walk and and they find yeah. it easier but it's yeah. it's better to encourage a proper trot but then you might have to be you know, running yeah <laughs> or walking very slowly right.
Yeah, no, I mean, again, I own a classic pacer, literally. She's called Classic, and she's very, very pacey. She's very, like, wooden, spotty dog, sort of like one, that side, mm. that side, that side. And, and it's a challenge. It is definitely mm. a challenge, and it's something that I think she came out of the womb doing. Like, she... Yeah, I, 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 that's my personal thing. I think some dogs do it, they find it... And breeds. Is, is it a problem? I don't know. You don't have any... <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, a hard, it's hard to assess dogs at pace i would say yeah. for, for laying it like oh <laughs> definitely. Definitely, definitely 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 more, more research needed as we often say with these things and so um i suppose for anyone who's listening to us rachel for anyone who's out there and thinking oh, i'd love to work with dogs or i know that we inspire so many um people to either rethink their career or um start again or really like we have some very young listeners as well who'll be coming up through and thinking God, this sounds amazing. For anyone that's considering working with dogs or for anyone that's considering working in these areas, how would you, um, what, what, what advice would you give? How would you suggest they maybe um, went from here? Like, what would you suggest they maybe did? Oh, well, I think that would be different. I, th- I think if we were talking about young people who were thinking they might want to go into a very, uh, you know, into a veterinary career, I think that what I used to do was, was lots and lots of experience that was not just at vets. So I think people think, oh, I must go. It's important to go to a vet for work experience because you might find you, you hate it or you can't stand the sight of blood or something. So important to find that out, really, before you get Definitely. to the vet. Very important. But, uh, you know, lots of experience, experience around farms or horses as well, because unfortunately at the moment you can't specifically be a dog vet. So you have to do everything on the course yes. and then yeah. you don't have to do experience. And kennels, I, you know, I used to work in the kennels and I just was used to handling lots and lots of things dogs and I think that's that's probably good experience for anybody going forward so yeah if anyone wants to, to consider a veterinary career I think it's just sort of broadening your mind and, and getting as much different sort of experience as possible that that's why I always still still do a lot of exotic work because I've kept a lot of exotic animals and I've been to lots of clubs and talks and so I know what's normal and I think that's the thing to, to find out what's abnormal you need yeah. to know what's normal. so yeah. that I think would be the top advice for that if people are wanting to retrain into the rehab um rehab world then yeah lots of great avenues to to do you know there's lots of hydrotherapy and um you know physiotherapy there are a number of sort of good courses out there now and i think if people want information as to what would be a good course to go on i would look on ramp which is a ramp website i would declare an interest because i'm the small animal vet liaison on the committee for ramp but it, it's the register of animal musculoskeletal practitioners so basically it's a register for um, a certain standard of qualification because the problem with things like veterinary physiotherapy it's not a protected title so you could go off and do a weekend course in something and say well oh, I'm a veterinary physiotherapist you know uh, so yeah. it's really hard to know and the same with massage you can do a weekend your weekend massage course and say oh, I'm a massage therapist or you can spend years and years training and be you know, extremely skilled at it so and yeah. it's hard to, it's hard to know so that's the idea behind ramp is that you can so if you look on there and there's they have all the courses that they recognize which work to a really high standard so that would give people an idea where to look what would be a good course to to, to think about going yeah. and that yeah. covers you know physios and chiros and osteos and things as well so it, it, it covers a broad range of people are, are no, that, is really cool. that is really cool like really cool Give, it gives people a little I suppose a way in and I think we have so many listeners who listen going oh my goodness I wish I had done that or I wish I could do that or maybe I should consider that in, in the future and um, one one other question um a couple of your favorite conditioning exercises personally so a couple of your like favorites or your cores or your your mm. always go back to um yes. like what they be yes my uh, my absolute favorite is the is the superman is the diagonal leg lift I've probably given some of yours this I don't want to show you so um yeah, sorry you've just gone to sleep <laughs> They, they do need to be standing, not like flopping down like they can't stand. But it's just lifting up and turn up front and back legs. And when they get strong, as she is normally should be, it, they, you can stretch them forward and backwards. You can't see, but it turns into a Superman stretch. Uh, you, you probably you don't want to start with that one actually if they've never done that one before. You want to start with doing it. We call a three-legged stance, so just lifting up, just lifting up one leg, just letting them balance for a few minutes, and then you can progress to just lifting up the alternate legs. And I think that's a great one. No, I think that's great. I think it's really great. And I think it's, um, I love how uh, she managed to get herself up and then take herself back to bed within the, uh, within the discussion about it. She was like, I am not superwoman today. 
And um, well, Rachel, it's been amazing uh, getting to chat to you, chatting to you a little bit about what you do, where you do it. And um, like I said, I have really valued having you on um, and as part of my um, dog's team in the last year and obviously knowing you way before that. But actually, uh, it's really made a difference over the last year, because I suppose often you only find these things when you run into problems. And actually only you start looking then when you've run into problems. I know that all of our listeners will be hugely grateful to hear what you can bring to the table. Um, and um, obviously, I know you work in the UK. You're in the southwest. What area are you working in? Well, I'm at the moment in Herefordshire, Ledbury, just off the M50. But from the end of July, I will be I'm actually opening my own clinic as well. So I'm, uh, that's the hospital I work at there. And I'll still be there. Uh, I'll, I'll still be running that that place. But I'm um, also working. Uh, we'll be opening up a dedicated rehabilitation clinic in near Dursley in Gloucestershire. So yeah, we're definitely sort of west south southwest area. But I will getting to closer to me. Getting closer. I, I, just for you, I'm moving a little bit closer. <laughs> I'm very grateful. I am very very grateful, Rachel. Well, it's been amazing chatting to you. That was this episode of the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for bringing your expertise to the table. Uh, literally, I know our listeners are going to be uh, looking at their dogs even more carefully. And remember, stay sexy.